say that this morning, God, we trust you. God, as we look at your word this morning, may you, may you call out areas in our life that, God, we have withheld, that we have kind of just let go untouched because we're not really sure if we can trust you with that area. We've been able to trust you in certain things, but not everything. So this morning, God, we just ask that your word would be just as it is, living and active. And God, it would do its work to divide, to move that, that which is true into the forefront and that which is false to be completely removed, replaced by trust in you, God. Father, we ask that you just have your way in our lives and what you want to do. In Jesus' name, I said, and why don't you go and have a seat. Two weeks ago, we started this series just called Start Here. And as we started this series, we, we set it up by asking a simple question, like, what are you seeking after, right? And so when we Looked at this idea of seeking after, what we begin to see is when we talk about seeking after something, like we look at the first question that we need to first ask is, am I doing it intentionally or am I just kind of considering it, right? And so the first week we just simply asked this question, um, Riley, if you don't mind throwing that up there, um, am I, you know, intentionally pursuing God or am I just casually, you know, considering him? And we talked about the different areas in which we do that often. And really, the, the invitation in that week was found in a verse in Jeremiah. This just simply says, when you seek me, you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. And so he's saying, if you come after me, I'm just first things first. Number one, I'm not really hard to find. Um, it's, it's really easy to find me. But if you seek after me, you're going to find me. But in order to find me, you have to seek at me with everything you have. And so he says, so start the pursuit. Last week we talked about God being good. And when we talk about God being good, we saw another invitation. And in that invitation, what we saw was um, the, um, the psalmist saying, taste and see that God is good. And blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. And so the simple invitation was, come to me, come close to me. Try me and experience for yourself how good I am. And so as we go into this week and as we start looking at trusting God, what, what we got to understand is throughout Scripture we see these different invitations. And throughout Scripture we have a response that's required. Either it's going to be something that's done intentionally or it's going to be something we just kind of casually go about and we, we maybe consider if it's convenient at the time. A lot of times, you know, we start really questioning things and moving with intentionality towards things when we begin to understand, like, hey, I have nothing else. So a lot of times it's in a situation where your family's all a mess, or maybe it's in a situation where you have a medical diagnosis that kind of, kind of focuses us in a little bit, and so we get a little bit more serious about our relationship with God, because in those moments we really need Him. And if He doesn't come through, then I don't know who else is going to come through, and I don't know where the answer is going to come from. And so today, as we look at this idea of God being trustworthy, we have to look and see what is his invitation, what is he asking of us today. And so as we look at Solomon talking to us in Proverbs, he, he simply says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. You see, when you read this scripture, trusting in God isn't about knowing all the details or having everything together or everything figured out. It's about knowing that he's the God that holds everything together. In um, Colossians 2, we read about a God who, or about Jesus, who um, the writer Paul says is the one who is even up until this moment holding all these things together. And as we learn to trust him, what we've got to see is his hands are the perfect size. His hands are just right to keep things from completely falling apart because he's the one that's in control of it. One of the favorite pictures I have for my own self is the picture of even Jesus on the cross as he's dying on the cross. He never lost grip of what is in his hands. And so today when we look at this 
command to trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean on your own understanding, we say, God, we want to trust you, even though we don't know all the details, because we know that you're the one who's holding all of this together no matter what. One person said it this way. I love the way they talk about lean not on your own understanding. He says, whenever you lean not on your own understanding, you're saying, I am giving up my need to know. And I'm surrendering and going, I know the God who knows every detail. I know the God who knows everything. And so I'm surrendering, God, my need to know about every detail. Think about the whole idea of asking God to change my circumstances last week. And God's wanting to shift your perspective. He's wanting us to get this picture of him that says, keep your eyes focused in on me. Focus in on the right things. All the details, yeah, details matter at times. But not if they keep you off track. Not if they get you off track. And so trusting God isn't about knowing all the details or having everything figured out. It's about holding these things in his hands. So if there's one thing I want you to understand today, because I've already said it twice now, and I put it up on the screen, it's this. He has everything in his hands. So whatever situation, whatever, whatever place you're coming from right now, you know that you are in good hands. You see, this week, like I said earlier, has been one of those moments where I've come back to this place where I found myself wondering, can I really trust God in this? There's been so many different situations, so many things, but there's been a couple that have been just really heightened. Ones that kind of, kind of set me off in different directions in my heart and in my, my soul and in my mind. And, and so I have to then at that place go, God, can I really trust you? And it wasn't because I didn't believe him when he said that he can do certain things. But it's just natural. It's natural for you and I to question things. It's natural for you and I to face something and go, okay, God, can I really trust you with this? And it's something that I want you to see that even as a person that's standing up here talking to you right now, that you look at to go, oh, give us some information from the Bible. I'm looking at it going, there's times where I look at God and God go, I go okay, God. Can I really trust you in this? And can I, can I share with you one thing that really kind of hit me this week? I even ask that question when I think the term is, I have the receipts. Is that the right term now? Okay. Don't know if that's right. Is that right? I'm looking at my son to go, is that the right thing? He's like, embarrassed. Yeah, don't use that again. Anyways, like, I have a really trustworthy, consistent record of God being trustworthy over and over and over again. Like, I don't even have to, like, like when I think about certain situations and certain things I was going through this week, a friend of mine reminded me, he's like, yeah, you've said that before, and what was the answer, and what did God do? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I, f I forgot. Let me look through the receipts and see if I can find that one, right? There you go, okay? <laughs> but my family knows I have an issue with receipts, okay? My wife will say amen in the back, Okay? I have to have a receipt. I get a receipt for everything. But I don't do anything with them. They just sit on my nightstand or on my desk somewhere. Brian, who takes care of all the receipts for the church, is like, yes, you can give them to me. And I'm like, I forget to give them to you, but I have them somewhere, right? Anybody else have that problem when you got to do like reimbursements? Yeah, I hate receipts, okay? I hate them in love. I have this love-hate relationship with them. I don't know if it's just this comfort, but like, it's like, okay, I paid for it. I'm going to make sure that no one rips me off because it says that I have this amount and this is who I paid it to and all this stuff. But it really isn't about that. I don't know what it's about. But in my faith journey, like I have many of those. And it started from a really young age. But can I tell you my hardest area to trust God often? And I want you to hear this. Just hear me all the way through it is in the area of finances. Always has been my biggest. Don't know why. And do you know what I have the most records with God on, God coming through with, him being trustworthy in? You want to take a guess? Finances. You're like, dummy, when are you going to get it? And I'm turning around to you and go, dummy, when are you going to get it? Because no matter what it is, it could be finances for me, it could be whatever for you, you probably are questioning and you probably continue to question the same thing. Even though you have the receipts, even though you have the record of going, no, he's been faithful over and over and over and over again. I learned from a very young age to surrender even the idea of finances to God. I remember at a very young age, 
like learning how to give, giving to missions, funding missions projects, and having to take what I have and go, okay, God, I only have this much, but I feel there's something inside of me that's saying give it. And so I'm going to give it to you. And every time I've done that, it's been like God just blesses and blesses and blesses. And see, that's a track record. That's something that I know that God continues to do even through different times, through college and through different um, instances or journeys that I've had along the way. Whether it's been going on mission trips and them going, it's going to be $2,400 for you to, to go on this trip. And I'm like, I don't have $2,400. My parents don't have $2,400. And someone going, just trust God, he'll provide. I'm like, okay, trust God, he's going to provide. Okay, God, I'm typing out this letter, you know, sending it to people and God provides. And, the, and here's the interesting part about this. God has never just provided the exact dollar amount for me, ever. It's never been that. It's always been over and above. I don't know why, but it has been. Like the first mission trip, this is probably the one that I remember most of all. I went to Africa. I don't think any of you guys went to Africa, did you? I have another youth leader here this morning too, Darwin and Margaret here, okay, which is even, it's more fun, okay? Um, but like we went to Africa and they said, hey, this is the cost of the trip. And I remember raising money for that trip, doing all kinds of things, car washes, bake sales, all that stuff, bike you know, whatever it is. But sending out letters to people saying, hey, will you support me? And I remember getting over a thousand more dollars than what I needed. And I actually pay, helped paid for somebody else's trip. Like, so it's like when you look at it and go, okay, God, you're, are you really trustworthy when it comes to finances? Oh, that's one story of many stories that we have that God continues to do that and show himself faithful over and over and over again. In one area of our life, Katie and I, from the very young age when we got married, we were 21 when we got married, <clears throat> one of our good friends' parents kind of was like a little bit of a mentor. We looked up to them. One of the advice they gave to us was, hey, as much as you can, live without debt. And we're like, okay, that's going to be hard, but we'll try it. And we do. We don't live with debt. Like we've been, God has been faithful to provide what we need when we need it. And it's been in this place of being to say, God, it's not mine, it's yours. Do what you want to do with it. Even to the place where this year we've been blessed in different ways where we've been able to give more than we've ever been able to give. And it's just because I think God knows that where our hands are open to go, God, whatever you want to do, you do. But one of the instances this week was, again, something coming back and hitting that, that financial thing. Okay, God, can I really trust you in this? Right? I mean, I don't know if you noticed, there's some walls up now. Like, they're, it's starting to take shape a little bit. And so, but all the walls and the electrical and soon to turn heat on, all that stuff costs a lot of money, right? And so you start going, okay, God, are you going to trust you? You know? But then I look at the receipts, I look at the records, and I begin to see, no, God has been completely faithful. He's been continually trustworthy. To the point where when we were going through the adoption process, we actually had some debt on a car that we owed. And through the whole adoption process, that was $25,000. Not only did God meet that need and we never had a, a penny of debt after it, but we, we also never, we didn't have that loan on that car anymore. That was paid off as well. So over that time, there was about $31,000 that somehow God goes, here. And you're like, oh, here we go. We're, we're in church. We're talking about finances. No, I'm talking about my struggle. Does everybody understand this? I'm talking about the struggle that I have and why I have it. You can look at me and you can go, dummy, do you not see it? Because literally, I'm telling you that I don't see it at times, even though I see it. Even though I've seen his faithfulness over and over and over again. I mean, this building itself, this property itself is a financial miracle. And it all started with us sitting in a room saying, can we just pray that God will just give us this building debt free? And we are in this building debt-free. To this point, we're debt-free. And it's been an it's answer to prayer over and over. Right now on my desk, I have a couple different things that I have written out um, that I, I always want to keep at the forefront of like my mind. But they're recent ones. And here's the two things that I have written down. Like on my desk, I have a little sticky note on my desk or I have them on my computer written somewhere or in a journal somewhere. And it's these two things. Physical obedience always brings spiritual release. I, it's not always, but brings spiritual release. To me, that's one of the things that I've said over and over again, but it's put together so good. Like when we just obey him, he just opens it up. It's the best way of understanding it. The one I'm leaning into right now is as I read about the New Testament church, 
and about the people of God. It said, miracles, signs, and wonders follow those who believe. I look and I go, I don't see stuff following me right now. <laughs> I'm like, where's my belief at? But as I look at all the different things that I struggle with, I, I come back to this place of going, okay, God, what do, you, what do you need to show me? What are the things that you need to continue to change about me? Because as we've said over the last couple of, th- couple of weeks, like, we all have these stories that we believe, and they're anchored in something. It might be a false thing that God is wanting to change, and he's wanting to transform, and he's wanting to inject truth in it so that you can be the person that he's called you to be. And I also, I also believe that when we can get past the fault, then we can see the second one on this list begin to happen. Because some of us in this room don't even believe that those things even still exist. And I go, God blow their minds. Because there's people in this room, there are miracles. There's things that God is doing in this place and outside of this place and in your homes and in your workplaces that are signs to what he's doing. Like, and so we're just going to continue to push and go, God, what do you want to, what do you want to do? But here's the, here's the root, here's the false narrative that's controlling this part of my life, okay? I'm not just talking to you. This is just a counseling session. You're the counselor. I'm just the person in here right now, okay? The hardest thing for me has always been, there's never enough. I'm never enough. And those are things that God has broken down. Like, I don't look at that so much anymore. But here's the thing. The enemy always wants to bring me back to that. Like, see, told you. And I'm like, wait a sec. No, I know that one. You can't fool me that time, right? But what is it? What's the false false narrative? What's the untrue story about that lie that the enemy is trying to entangle you in right now? Because he's wanting to establish a truth in your life and my life. And we have to just come to this place of going, okay, God, here's this lie. I understand it's a lie. I give it to you. I confess it. I repent of it. God, help me to move forward in it. You see, I have a confession first of all to make, okay? I have bought a single sign from Hobby Lobby. Okay, good. I'm not rejected. Okay. But the only reason I bought it is because of what it said on it, okay? And it simply says this, gratitude, gratitude turns what I have into enough. I don't know if you know, I don't like Hobby Lobby that well, okay? I, and all the women just went, I dislike you now. <laughs> and then here's the reason why I don't. And anybody that's helped plow this lot will know why, you, why I'm saying this. Because in the middle of the massive snowstorm, Dan can attest to this, for some reason... These women decide they need inspirational signs in the middle of a massive snowstorm. And then we've got to keep the like plowed sidewalks and salted and all this stuff. And if there's not a grain of, you know, like it's, it's all crazy. But I, I, I'm joking when I say that. But not about the snowplow part, but about the signs, okay? Sometimes something catches your attention. And it sets a false thing to a truth. Why a few moments ago did we just take a moment to go, maybe there's something God wants you to share. Maybe there's something that you just need to say, thank you, God. Well, all of that that just happened there, I got to tell you, it was a moment of gratitude for me. It was a moment where God goes, look at what I'm doing. Look at what I've done. And so each and every one of us, we can learn just a little bit from that to say, God, what are you wanting me to hear? What are you wanting me to see? Because I really, truly want to trust you with everything I have. I think many of us have been at the same place that I am at or have been at multiple times. You see, we believe God, we believe in God, but when challenges come, whether it's our finances or health or relationships, we start to question. And the questions we simply ask over and over again is, will he come through? And can I trust him fully? Those are just two things that the majority of the people in this room, when stuff happens, we, we come to those things. In his book, um, Good and Beautiful God, one of the ones we've kind of crafted the series off of, um, James Bryan Smith says this way. He says, one common thing is that God is only, one of the common things that we say over and over is, uh, one of the false narratives we say over and over is, is that God is only trustworthy when things go well for us. 
or that he care, his care is conditional on how, uh, sorry, on how we perfectly, how perfectly we live. Okay, so let me put this up here because I did have a slide for it. The default narrative that most of us believe is this, God's only trustworthy when things go our way for us and his care is conditional on how we perfectly we live. Some of us really don't believe that God can be that because we look at our own lives and go, why would he do that? Because look how bad I am. Look at what I just did. Can God really be? And God looks at you and he doesn't see you any different than what he sees on the cross of Christ. If you're one of his. Because he's forgiven it. But yet we come to him with this whole list of like, well, God, this is why I'm not trustworthy. And God goes, that's okay. I don't change. I'm trustworthy. And God's wanting to replace this false narrative in which you and I believe, and he's wanting to do it in a way that really brings us to this place of having to fully surrender those things to him. You see, there's a story in the New Testament in which Jesus tells, some don't, like some philosophers, some scholars don't know if this was actually a real thing or it was just a story Jesus was telling to get a point across, but it says that one day uh, someone came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, what, what must I do, or sorry, Right here. Someone came to Jesus with this question, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And you, some of you know the story as a rich young ruler, and he says this, why, um, why ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There's only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you receive, the, if you receive eternal life, keep the commandments. And this is, this is the interesting part of this to me. The response back were, which ones? We don't ever do that, right? Well, God, you're asking me to do this, but what specifically are you asking me to do? And God, really, what's the cost going to be in that? Because if you ask me to do something, like, can you just make it really detailed and maybe not include this part, or maybe make it so I can go, well, he didn't really say completely that it was that, right? But he, he wants to know which ones, the man asked. And Jesus replied, and I love Jesus' reply because I think some of them are like, duh, Right? Like, the guy's praying, they're going, well, that's easy. Well, that's easy, right? To him, I think he knew the person's heart and was like going, okay, I'm going to get him right here. Because he's going to go, yep, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, right? Do not commit adultery, or do not murder. You must not commit adultery. Do not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. Majority of us in this room would go, perfect. Done all those things. Of which, that's exactly how he replied. I've obeyed all these commandments. The young man replied, what else must I do? That's, that's <laughs> right, there was a problem. He should have just stuck at which ones, right? Because he would have been like, perfect, I'm good to go, let's get this done. But he says, what else must I do? And Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, let me stop right there for a minute. The Greek word in there is, the idea of it is, what do I need to do to be complete, to be whole? And he simply says this, go sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. Jesus goes to the very thing that has the man's heart, his possessions. It's the things, it's the stuff. Murder, easy. Easy. Adultery, easy. Like, love your neighbor, easy. Honor your father and mother, either, easy. Go sell everything and follow me. Get rid of all your possessions. This is the response. Riley, if you can click that next slide, my, I, my notes just crashed. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad for what? He had many possessions. I came across this quote this week, and it's one that if you... I want you to anchor in on the rest of this thing. But it simply says this. What you attempt to blank the most often reveals where you trust God the least. Now let me tell you what was in that quote, but I think there's more to this than just that word that was in there. What you attempt to control the most often reveals where you trust God the least. And the room got silent. And that's what happened to me this week. What you attempt to control the most often reveals what you trust the least. 
We do it all the time. We do it in our finances. We do it with our health. We do it with all these things. If we can just do this right, if we can just get this right, then everything's going to be right. And then there's no need to have to really have to trust somebody else for something because we can just do it on our own. But I imagine this this week. I'm not a rich young ruler. And I'm rich, I'm not young anymore. I don't rule anything. Okay? <laughs> so then I started thinking, okay, Jesus, what would you say to me? Um, old, not poor, but, you know, I have enough. And I don't, the ruler thing, I don't know what that would go. But anyways, what would you say to me? And I think the biggest thing is, is the area of control. Because control for me is the one that is really the hard one to trust God. When I control that thing, when I, when I can really make things happen, then I don't really have to trust in God. I make it really easy for him. Some of us do this quite often when we just go, hey, you know what, I know that this happened, and here, here's the initial response to some of the stuff that was happening this week. I got to fix this. I got to figure out how to get this done. I got to figure out how to do this, 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 and this. What's the key word in there? I, 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 I. And it soon became, there ain't nothing I can do to fix this situation. All I can do is hand it over to God and say, God, would you just do what you do and what you're best at doing? Because we do really need you to come through. You see, this story reveals several, several different truths. The first one is this. Right, I just need you to cook through these. The first one is this. Trusting God versus security of your possessions. Some of us, man, we've been anchored in on what we have. And we're missing out on those areas in which God wants to increase our dependence on him and trust him. Some of us are very good at figuring things out. I have a good ability to problem solve. It's one of my things I think I'm really good at doing. I have a really, but in problem solving, oftentimes that comes across as controlling. If it's unsolicited, right? So one of the best advice my wife gave me about having older children now was, don't give them any advice until they ask for it. That's a hard one. But I've done pretty good, would you say? Would you put a thumb up in the air so people, yeah, see, there we go. <laughs> Just need to validate that, right? It's hard. It is very hard. But I got to trust him with it. Because God's got a plan for Zeke. God's got a plan for Calcadon. God's got a plan for Selah, which she'd get a job. But she got, he's got plans for her. <laughs> Hopefully she watches this service. Okay, um, but I got, I got to trust that he's got a purpose and he's got a plan. Because you know what the beautiful part about this? I've got to watch as God just is blowing even Selah's mind when it comes to trusting him. Because as we went into this school year and we were trying to figure out what does this look like? How much are you going to owe for school and all this stuff? Like we got to the day and we got to the place where she had to pay and she had enough money in her bank account to pay for her first semester of college. And she goes, Dad, I prayed and God answered and I'm like, yeah, duh, pretty new answer. You know, like, thanks for reminding me, you know. But that, but in her, we see, that we we're seeing that. Like, God, we're, she's just like, I just trust him. He takes care of me. We ask her a question, like, well, what, what about this? Well, I don't know. God will take care of it. Okay. You know, like, better than me. The second one we see, though, in this several truths we see from this story is this. Following Jesus requires surrender. Like, it's hard. One of the things like God just keeps um, kind of showing me is how often we go, like when we have issues or we have problems, or we have stuff, we want to go to people instead of him. And there's one thing that he keeps showing me. So many times we want to go to like our earthly, we'll just give a representation. We want to go to our earthly father instead of going to a heavenly father. Because we think that they can fix it. Like as much as Zeke would want to come to me and ask me different things, like one of the things we continue to try to do is like, well, what is God saying? Like, I, I can't give you anything else other than, hey, you need to, you need to pray and you need to trust him. Is it, uh, my, my abilities, what I have at my fingertips, except, like, I have limited, like, capacity. I have limited 
quantity of things to give away. But I know a Heavenly Father who has unlimited resources, who can meet each and every one of your needs. So can we learn to trust Him in it? But it's going gonna, it's gonna to come with me surrendering all those things to Him. The second thing we see in this story as well is this. Is, um, go to the next slide. Trusting God, it, we must shift our focus off the material temporal things to the eternal. That's the hard thing. Because we like our stuff. Everybody say amen. And if you're not saying amen, you're all lying and I'm stepping back because there might be lightning, right? No. Like, we do. We love our stuff. We love things. But what if all those things are ripped away? Do you love him? What if? I had this um, picture this week. And actually, I was telling the staff about it on um, Friday. I said, what if God just all of a sudden just interrupted our broadcast? (laughs) Right? And he began to take over the screens. And he began to like show clips of maybe your, uh, the way you parent on the screens. And he began to reveal like the areas in which you don't trust him. But everybody could see it. Like for some of you, like if he took and he, he highlighted your giving record or he highlighted your checkbook. Like, what, what would it say about your trust in God? And I'm not talking about your giving record. I hear even. I, I'm talking about, like, when he's asked you to, like, maybe sacrifice at times, and you're kind of like, well, I can give that. Like, what, what would happen if he took over? Like, would you be willing, would you be able to sit there and go, yeah, look it, I trust in God. Or would you be like, how low can I go? Like, can I get underneath the chair? But here's the beautiful thing about God. God, God's not into that. And someday you will, you'll obviously stand before him and you'll be judged on what you did or didn't do with what he gave you and what he asked you to do with it. And then we also know to whom much is given, much is required. We also know that he, those who are faithful a little will be given more. And so like you can just deal with those things and let God deal with those. But what I'm saying is this. We have to shift our focus off the material temporal things and we have to begin to see things from an eternal perspective. Like, what, what difference is this making, God, as I, as I step forward and as I obey you? Trusting God is all about shifting our focus from those temporal, eternal things and recognizing that God's kingdom offers a treasure far beyond what wealth can provide. Far beyond. Now, I know you've heard the quote that said, I've never seen somebody sat on a jet ski. I understand that, Right? Well, unless the jet ski's breaking down all the time, right, carpenters, right? Yeah, so you get what I'm saying, though. Like, the wealth that we can accumulate here only brings momentary relief. It only brings momentary satisfaction because then there's always this desire inside of us for some reason for more. The last thing that we see is when we trust God, there are barriers to trusting God. And the barrier looks different for most of us in this room. Some of us, it may have a consistency to it, but for the most part, most of us have a barrier that keeps us there. For the the illustration, the story that we just read, it was the possessions. He had acquired a lot of things. And those lot of things became the idols in which he worshipped. You see, the rich young ruler had the inability to give up his up his wealth, when he, show, when he did that, he showed that he had a stronger, that had a stronger grip on him than his desire to truly trust Jesus and follow Jesus. You see, ultimately, this passage really teaches us that placing our full trust in God above everything else, including material possessions or worldly status. But what we see in this is this thing is that God is trustworthy. You can trust him in every single thing. And then Here's the thing I want you to see. Jesus' call to the young man is a call that is a call to every single one of us, all believers, to trust God with our whole heart, not holding anything back. You see, so how do we move, how do we shift from that place? I just want to give you real quick things, and the team's going to come, and we're going to do this. But we shift the way that we see things by looking at his track record, by looking at the record of receipts that he has. 
right? So we read in Numbers, we read, God is not a human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? He doesn't. He's the same. Isaiah 55, 11 says, So my word that goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish all that I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it out. 2 Timothy 2, 13 says this way, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. You heard that in Bill's prayer just a little bit ago. You cannot go against yourself. It's who you are. Hebrews 6, 18 says it this way. It says, if it, if it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of this hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. He can't lie. He cannot change. And so that's our hope, that's our anchor, is in the fact that he is trustworthy. And his record confirms it over and over and over again. And what we see is that he keeps his word. Even when we doubt, even when we question, even when we mess up. The verse I wake up to most of the time, every morning, is simply this verse in Lamentations. Go ahead, Laura. It just simply says this. It is because of the Lord's loving kindness that we are not consumed. It's because of his tender compassions that, he, that uh, compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great and beyond measure is his faithfulness. I want you to zoom in or go back up to the top for a minute. His, his, his compassions are new every morning because of what? His loving kindness. It's just who he is. And so his trustworthiness meets us right where we're at. And, um, and what we see in this is in Psalms 145, it says, The Lord is trustworthy in all he does, and he promises and faithful um, he promises, and he's faithful in all that he does. If we don't, like if we can't get our minds around this, we have to continue to go back to his record. And what we begin to see in this is this positional kind of trust. There's no place in which we cannot trust him. There's no space in which we will enter that we cannot not trust him because he is trustworthy no matter where we're at. The second thing we see about his trust is it's also generational. How do we know that? Deuteronomy 7, 9 says it this way. It says, know therefore that the Lord your God is God, and he is faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. It doesn't stop. It's not con con uh, constrained or confined to a certain time. There is no limit to his trust. Psalms 9, 10 says it this way, those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. If you miss everything else today, write this scripture down. Read it over and over this, again this week. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. It began with an invitation and the invitation is to intentionally pursue him, not continue to casually consider him. Why? Because his name matters. Who he is matters. Who he is matters to your story. And so today, something in our minds, something in our hearts, something in our lives has to shift. So how do we apply this? Well, it goes back to that initial quote that I said earlier. What you attempt to, you fill in the blank the most, often reveals where you trust God the least. Most of the time, we can just probably prop, plop, control in there. Or maybe we have to reword it a little bit to kind of get to our correct answer. But what I really want to say to you is this, is it starts with this place of going, if control is the thing, then God, I surrender this control to you. Because you're the one, you don't mess up. I mess up. So as much as I've done good, Zeke can raise both of his fingers and go, yeah, you messed up too a few times, right? Because that, we're human. But God doesn't mess up. You see, if you've been living according to these false narratives, maybe you've been thinking that God is distant and only trustworthy when things go well. Here's the best news, the good news. God's trustworthiness doesn't depend on your circumstances. It is rooted in his unchanging nature. His unchanging nature. 
How did Jesus see a God who is trustworthy? Well, in Matthew chapter 6, it tells us that he knew God as a father. And a father who knows everything you need even before you ask him. And so his narratives weren't shaped by all the circumstances. His narrative was shaped by the unchanging name of God. And the name of God that he gave him was Abba or Father. And it's unchanging. And so today, even as we look at how do we move forward, how do we go forward from this, how do we move out of this place, and how do we begin to walk in that trust and knowing that God is trustworthy, we have to come to this place of going, God, I truly trust you. The verse, I don't think it's any coincidence that it's a verse that I've had written down for years and years and years. It comes from 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, and I want to encourage you, go read 1 Thessalonians 5, because it even talks about, I believe, times in which we live right now. But at the very end of it, he make, the writer Paul right, makes this statement. He says, the one who's called you is faithful, and he will do it. Not you, but him. This has been an anchor verse. This has been one of those life verses for me that I hold on to each and every time I come up against some of these things. And so today, what I really want to say to you is this. Do you truly believe that he's trustworthy when it comes to your kids? Do you truly believe he's trustworthy when it comes to your job? Do you truly believe that he's trustworthy when it comes to your finances? Do you truly believe that he's trustworthy in whatever it may be? Because I truly believe God is wanting to reshape and transform the way that you and I see him in this way of, is he truly worthy of our trust? But today it comes to a place where we just we have to step back and go, I trust you, God. Some of you, you're going through something right now medically, and you're just going, God, I, have to, I, like, I can't do anything else but trust you. That's great. And the moment that you're in right now, I'm so glad you're doing that. But when everything's clear and the diagnosis is great, are you saying and living the same way? When you're dirt poor or when you're super rich, are you still worshiping a God who's completely trustworthy? That's the question. Team's going to come. We're just going to end this morning by singing. If we can just sing the name song, can we just do that? Um, we're just going to end by just singing his name. Can we do that? Because I want to go back. I want us just to anchor in on that for a minute. If we know his name, he is trustworthy. And I, I spelled it out for you guys again this week. Period. In case you missed a little dot at the end. Okay? He is trustworthy. And today, my prayer, my hope is, is as you sing this song, as you spend some time even today during this final moment of service or you get into your car this week, maybe there's some conversations that you need to have with people that just simply say, God, I'm, or, or maybe not God, well, God first. Hey, I'm sorry that I've tried to control things. But maybe God's going to ask you to go to somebody else and say, hey, I'm sorry that in this, like I couldn't, I couldn't see what I needed to see. And what I need to see is that I have a God who's completely trustworthy. And so I, I've just got to put this situation in your hands, God. Would you just close your eyes for a minute? Um, this morning, maybe you're just in this room and you just are like, trust is just a hard thing, Period. And trust is a hard thing because of the stories in which I've lived, the stories in which I believe. And maybe God's been one of the hardest ones to trust because of the earthly example or the physical example you have here on this earth of what trust really looks like. But maybe like you today is that day where you say, hey, I've got to surrender. Maybe it's like you're the one coming to Jesus that day going, which ones do I need to keep, God? Which, what, what is the way to be complete? And I believe that maybe God is speaking possessions to some of you. Maybe to some of you, he's saying, you need to trust me with your kids. Maybe to some of you, he's, he's saying, you need, to do, you need to step out in faith in something. Maybe it's in a, an area of work, or maybe it's in uh, something that you're doing investment-wise that God is asking you to do it. But you, you've backed off because you're just like, I can't control this. And so if I let this out there, then I have to truly trust God in this. If today, if, you, if you're like me and you've struggled with trust, 
I just want to say today is the day to just say, God, I surrender it all to you. It doesn't mean we're not going to have questions. It doesn't mean that we're going to doubt it. But I want us as a church just to say, God, we trust you. If you struggled with just trusting God in certain issues, would you just pull your hands up for a minute? Keep them up. Father, today, these hands are stretched out to you because we trust you. I just had this picture as I started saying that. I remember when my kids were little, they used to put their arms up, and then when they put their arms up, we'd pick them up, and we'd, we'd take them up, and we'd put them on our hip, or we'd put them on our, our shoulders. And their position changes. Where before they were just seeing bodies and they were seeing things. As soon as they got picked up, they were brought to a different perspective and they could see all that they needed to see. And it's like God's just showing me that he's picking you up right now and he's taking you to a new perspective and he's helping you to see things that you never saw before. For some of you, it may just be he's holding you on your hip, but some of you, he might be putting you on his shoulders because you need to see things and clearly see things. But right now, God, I just pray that you would release sight, perspective to those in this room that, God, have just been staring at waistlines, seeing things from this earthly perspective. And God, you see the hands outstretched to you. They've said, God, I've just struggled with it. Because of the stories, because of the the records that I have, God, I, I just have struggled. And I don't want to struggle anymore. God, I pray that you would pick them up, that you would put them in a different position to see the things that you want them to see, to see things the way that you see things. God, you would release those chains, and those chains wouldn't just be grabbed onto and held onto any longer, but they would be let go of. God, today, we just want to say you are our Father, and you know everything that we need. And Jesus, you showed us that we don't, we don't have a father that gives us, um, when we ask for a loaf of bread, gives us a stone, God. God, you are a good father. God, you said we're even better than that as earthly fathers. So God, do you know everything that we need even before we ask it? And so in this moment right now, God, as we get ready to sing your name, God, I pray that, Lord, you would just show us exactly what we need right now. In this circumstance that you're in right now, I just truly believe God's saying, just, God, ask him, God, what do you need me to see? Because I see things a certain way, but God, as you lift me up, as you change my perspective, God, what are you wanting me to see? And today, I pray that he would just give you revelation like you've never had before. That there would be an opening of your eyes like you've never, ever seen before. And that there would be such a release That even walking out of this place, you'd feel lighter. So Jesus, we just pray. as We declare your name over each and every um, situation that we find ourselves in. God, we just declare that your name is above all names. There's no other name like your name. Anchor us in that truth. May it be our foundation in everything that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand up and just sing this final song with us this morning and declare this from your lips this morning. Everlasting, everlasting Father.
page will turn So I will trust your timing I will rest secure Oh, this is a steady kind of morning um, we're just going to kind of leave the room kind of the way it is right now and teams is going to continue to worship but um, we understand different times you got to take off different places and do things but I just want to encourage you take some time pray spend some time in prayer before you leave 
Um, if you need prayer, um, there's different people that would love to just meet with you, pray with you. Um, and so, um, like, Bill and Jess, would you guys, are you guys okay, like, shifting over somewhere? Like, Bill and Jess, uh, Keith, Bonnie, Todd, if you guys don't mind just kind of positioning yourself. Um, I'm going to have them just, if they're okay with it, just kind of shift over to places. If you need prayer about any specific thing, um, I encourage you to go find them. There's two back there. Um, uh, they're going to move over to the sides over here. So Bill's in the middle back there. Um, just if you need prayer, we'd love just to take some time and pray with you. Um, real quick, we have there's a bunch of different things that are going on. Just if you're interested, Tuesday night we're going to be continuing building um, some walls and stuff. If you're interested in that, we'd love to have you. Fall Fest, we're going to have in a couple Sundays as well. We'll give you more information. There's not really a good place to do announcements this week. Um, and so, but we, like I said, we want to send land in this place of going, God, we trust you. If you have to leave, we totally understand, but we'd love just to spend some time. If you need prayer, like I said, we'd love to pray with you. But otherwise, we hope that you have a great week. Let me pray with you one more time, and then we can head out. Father, I thank you um, for the work that you're doing. God, that song is so true that your names say it all. Even to the people of Israel, when Moses asked, what name should I give them? You said, I am, I am. That's who I am. And so God, that, that, those two words right there, God, just summarize everything. And so God, we thank you that in you, everything is complete. That you never change. But that God, you desire that we would change to become more and more like Jesus. But yet, God, in some way, I don't understand it, but God, you're incredibly patient with us. And so today, God, I pray that our lives would just be lived in surrender before you. So we thank you. Continue to change the way that we think. Continue to change how we see you. In Jesus' name, amen.